We are in the book of Judges. We are in session 9. In this session and the next session, we're going to talk about one of the most colorful characters in the book, a guy by the name of Samson. Maybe we could call tonight the light that flickered. And uh, next time, the light that fell. Samson's quite an enigma. We need to get a little perspective of the geography. We um, previously had been talking with Gideon and all this other stuff with Ammon, those that were east of the Jordan, Ammon, Moab, Edom, so on. The Philistines have been all this time along the coast, southern, most westward part of the country. They founded five cities. Uh, Gaza is very well known. Of course, even today, the Gaza Strip still remains as a, a, a one of their issues. Gath, Ashkelon, Ashdod, and Ekron are the five cities we're going to be hearing more and more about as we go through the uh, this episode with Samson, because Samson is in a place called Zorah, which is on the high ground above this valley that, that lies between. And he's going to go down to a city called Timna and get himself in all kinds of trouble. And just to give you a quick geographic perspective, uh, I thought we'd throw that in there. Uh, before we go too much further, we're going to be dealing with a very, very colorful enigma. He was very, very bold. He's sort of a he-man with a, a she-weakness, if you will. He, uh, <laughs> the epistle in, by James says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We're going to discover here's a man with incredible promise that will turn in a very disappointing performance. Uh, he was empowered by the Spirit of God, and yet we'll find him continually yielding to the appetites of his flesh. He was called to declare war on the Philistines, but he fraternized with his enemy. In fact, he even attempted to marry a um, Philistine woman. He fought the Lord's battles by day and then disobeyed the Lord's commandments by night. And he was given the name Samson. Samson means sunny, by the way. But he ends up in darkness. Blinded by the enemy he was supposed to conquer. A sad end to a promising life. We're going to talk a lot about the Philistines. So let's do a little backgrounder here. The Philistines were originally from Mitzrayim or Egypt. We learned that from Deuteronomy 2 and Genesis 10. Many people are confused by that. They say they came from Crete. They are recorded by Tacitus and others of coming from Kaftor, which was originally the northern delta of the Nile, interestingly enough, from which even the Phoenicians emigrate to the Middle East. But Crete was an intermediate west resting place and gave rise to the legends as to their source. Uh, they settled in Palestine uh, in Abraham's time. That's in Genesis 21 and 26. Uh, they, they are detailed there. Philistine means immigrants. That's what the term originally meant in Ethiopic Falasha. Uh, in the Hebrew, Palash means to wander, the wandering ones. Centuries later, the Romans will name this region after the Philistines. In Latin, that's Palestina. And they deliberately named it that to try to erase any memory of Jewish presence. And that goes back to the first and second centuries of the Christian era. Uh, when you use the term Palestine, you're using a label that was deliberately put on the region in a vain attempt to, to eradicate the, the rightful place of Israel in the land. And thanks to the British, the Romans almost succeeded. But uh, we live in an era where that is, uh, hope, I hope, sensitive. If you use the term West Bank or Palestine, you're using language of the enemies. It's called Judea and so on. By the time we get even to the Exodus out of Egypt, the Philistines had become very formidable. We find them referred to in Exodus 13 and 15 and elsewhere. They advanced north along the coast, all the way from the river Egypt, in Egypt, of course, to Ekron, which is the northernmost of the five famed cities. Each city of the Philistines had a lord or a leader over it. This confederacy of five cities, Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Gath, and Ekron, are frequently in the scripture, not the least of which there's a very colorful episode in 1 Samuel 4 where they manage to capture the Ark of the Covenant, much to their dismay, it turns out. It's one of the most humorous passages in the scripture. 
And I was tempted to jump into that full force just because of the humor of it all. But if we have time at the end, we'll double back on that because it's incidental to our, our thing here. They, they, they spoke a different language from Hebrew. And they sold the Israelites, many of them, into, uh, sla- into slavery uh, to both Edom, uh, to the uh, south east and to Greece, uh, obviously in the uh, way extreme northwest. They were very proficient in smelting iron. So that had a that was the advanced technology and weaponry. The iron chariots and the iron uh, uh, spears and things were, was a major advantage. And one of the things they did as they gained dominance in Israel is to outlaw all workers in iron. All smiths or iron mongers, whatever you want, however you want to label them, were, were outlawed. We find that is even in 1 Samuel 12. We're going to discover that Samson, all he did is really harass them. He prevented them, perhaps, from becoming stronger. But he doesn't overcome the Philistines, not really. That will fall upon Saul and David and following. When the monarchy rises, uh, things do uh, get better. They sometimes used to burn their prisoners alive. And we'll find an example of that in the next chapter. I should say next evening in chapter 15. Uh, There are threats of that that are material in the chapters that we're going to be looking at tonight. And they're alluded to in the Psalms and elsewhere. The region they're in is called the Shephelah. It's an undulating plain, about 32 miles long, about 9 to 16 miles wide. It rises a few hundred feet above sea level. Then in the east, it rises sometimes as high as 1,200, and then drops down to the valley, a very deep descent uh, into a valley. And uh, then across this valley, the hill country begins. That kind of flat plain is tremendously advantageous to chariots in contrast to the mountains. So that gives them a major, major technological edge, if you will. The region is very famed for fertility and grain, vines and olives. Some of the most uh, uh, fruitful wines come from the Sorek Valley, which will be the scene of some important uh, events in our session tonight. And and it's also a refuge in times of famine and Second Kings elsewhere. This whole area is a commercial thoroughfare between Phoenicia to the north and Syria to the north and Egypt and Arabia southward. And Ashdod and Gaza are two cities that really are the gateway, if you will, to this powerful empire uh, to the uh, south and to the, uh, well, I should say southwest. Okay, Judges 13 is where we are. Judges 13, verse 1. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. You know, this passage almost sounds like a refrain. As you've gathered by now throughout the book of Judges, they get delivered by whomever, and then they, they, as soon as they're delivered, they fall right back into this um, idol worship and, and disparagement of their heritage. And before we get too critical of them, we need to look in a mirror. Part of the value in, in, in uh, Judges is to realize it's timeless in a sense. And that includes us. By the way, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. That's a long time. That's a nominal lifetime. 40 years the Philistines are dominant in that area. A certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. The tribe of Dan was originally assigned in this region but couldn't cut it. They couldn't dislodge the land of its former inhabitants. So they, most of them, all but a few, moved north and staked out a claim up in the northern part of the country. And you'll find that in Judges, uh, chapters 18 and 19. Uh, They originally were from Judah and Benjamin, call it roughly Jerusalem, all the way to the Mediterranean, but they couldn't handle it. So you'll find the area of Dan is uh, generally regarded way, way up north, Lachish and all that. Now, Zora is a city about 15 miles west of Jerusalem. And it's almost on the Philistine border, if you will. And uh, the highest, it's the highest point on the Shephelah, this general region. And Samson would often cross, Zora was his hometown, but he often cross the border for his various whims, if you will. But his parents uh, get visited, a very exciting visit. The angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, It said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, 
and drink not wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So here is a supernatural announcement. Now, by the time you get to Judges, well, I say most of you, having studied your Bible, are familiar with Abraham and Sarah, same similar situation, Genesis 17. Amram and Jochebed in uh, Moses, Exodus 6. Uh, Elkanah and Hannah in uh, 1 Samuel 1, where Samuel is the child of promise. And, of course, this also echoes with familiarity from Luke 1, when both um, Elizabeth had uh, John the Baptist pre-announced to her, if you will, and, of course, Mary uh, and, and Jesus. So there are other servants of God that were chosen before birth. Jer- uh, Jeremiah in chapter 1. And, of course, Paul makes allusion to that in Galatians 1. And um, But there's an interesting thing before we get too carried away with. Psalm 139 teaches us that God is involved personally in every conception. That uh, you know, if we, we read this and say, "Well, gee, that's great. That was them. This was you know, God's right there on the main theme of God's plan. Indeed, they were, in, in many respects. And yet, uh, let's recognize from Psalm 139, girls that are pregnant and so forth, all children are God is involved with all conceptions. In fact, from microbiological considerations, DNA and the rest, I have had medical experts argue." that God has to be involved in every cell division. When does a stem cell know when to differentiate and how should it differentiate? You know, it's interesting, and let me give you an analogy. Let's assume that everyone in this room could play every musical instrument. You're all that skilled. And let's assume I had a complete orchestration of a major symphony, and I gave you each a copy. Would we have a symphony? Not likely, because there's a thing in computer design called conflict resolution. It's a a logical structure issue. Somebody has to decide that you are going to be first violin. You're going to be percussion. You're going to be the wood, whatever. Assign the roles, and so forth. You can't have a symphony without a conductor. Well, when when, when conception takes place, you've got a fertilized egg, and it splits, mitosis takes place, it splits, right? And I got two, and then four, and then eight, and you know it all grows. And it continues, they all, they all are identical for a while. But if you can watch this under a microscope, you begin to see a dark line develop. And you begin to, eventually becomes a backbone. You, you, there's a point at which some of the cells start differentiating into several hundred different kinds. And as we watch that, the fact that there may be all the information necessary in each cell doesn't explain how you get a such a complex family of systems so skillfully interweaving. Most awesome, awesome design that's ever been seen before the eyes of man is the human being. The, the, the evidence of design is compelling to all those that have an open mind. But the Romans 1 still prevails, right? When people are ignorant of that, they're willingly ignorant of that. But let's let's not start on all that again. So it's interesting. Here, though, is a conception that's documented with, for a very special destiny. But we, this idea of a Nazarite. What on earth is a Nazarite? Your authority for this is Numbers 16. The word actually means to separate or to consecrate. Now, the Nazarites in, in the Torah, yeah, in the book of Numbers, are uh, normally a Nazarite for a period of days. They speak of Nazarite of days, meaning normally it was a voluntarily vow to take on to be a Nazarite for a period of time. There are a couple of exceptions. Samson is one of those exceptions. He's a Nazarite from birth to death. John the Baptist was likewise a Nazarite, but that, those are exceptions. The Nazarites for days was the norm. The Nazarites forever, as the Mishnah likes to label it, classifies them, were perpetual. 
And both Samson and John the Baptist are distinctive in that regard. But what is a Nazarite? Typically, for a period of time, they consecrate themselves in a special way, and it generally involves three particular commitments. They abstain from drinking wine and any strong drink, or even touching grapes. They were separated from that uh, practice. Nothing wrong with that practice. That was just one of their distinctives. They were to avoid touching anything dead. Very Levitical kind of injunction. And one of the symbols or identity, a mark of identification, was they allowed their hair to grow. Not a razor was to touch their head. Now, normally that was for a period of time for, for a Nazarite of days. But for Nazarites forever, it was a very distinctive mark all the way through. And we're going to discover that Samson was a Nazarite from birth, but he, he will have, before long, have broken all three of these more than once. And he will throw a drinking party that lasted seven days. He killed a lion. He went back later to touch the carcass. In fact, made it a part of a riddle that we'll get into. And of course, the symbol of you know all the people who know nothing else about Samson all recall well he, you know he got a haircut from Delilah. You know, what's his hair got to do with it? Nothing, except to the extent it was a mark, and cutting his hair was just the final straw, if you will, that he had disavowed in his, his, his Nazarite commitments. The angel of the Lord appeared to the mother. And in verse 5, he says, For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come up on his head, for the child shall be a Nazareth unto God from the womb. I want you to notice the prophecy that the angel of the Lord gives her here. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. The tragedy of Samson is that he just did a, he, all he did is harass them. He was a champion, but not a leader. The lack of leadership is, is, is tragic here. So we talked about the Nazarite. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. Or awesome might be a better translation. And, uh, but I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and thou drink no wine or strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite uh, uh, to God from the womb, to the day of his death. Now, Manoah, that's the husband, arose and went after his wife and came to the man, apparently still around, and said unto him, Art thou the man that speakest unto the woman? He said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, of all that I said unto the woman, let her be beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink uh, wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. You know, the, the Scripture had already taught them what parents are supposed to do in Deuteronomy 6. The oft-quoted Shema, probably the most venerated text among uh, observant Jews. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. Here is the Lord our God is one God, and so forth. Jesus quotes that as the great commandment. So they had all that as background. And this, what, what he's focusing on are the uniquenesses here. Now, there's something, there's a couple of things here subtly before we get on. In verse 11, he said, Are you, art thou the man that speakest unto the woman? And what did he say? I am. Now, if you're just casual, casually reading this, okay, he's just acknowledging that he was. But if you've studied the Gospel of John, you'll discover that it's designed around seven I am statements. In fact, Jesus in John chapter 8 claims to be the voice of the burning bush. Remember when Moses had that encounter? And he questions him, you know, what, who shall I say sent me? You get the famous Ichyach, Asher Ichyach phrase, I am that I am, is the title of God. Not because of this phrase here, but we're going to discover why most, not all, but most scholars believe that this angel Lord is none other than a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Now, in that spirit, when we get down here to um, verse 12, now let thy words come to pass, that's actually in the Hebrew a grammatical error. The word and the verb are singular. And they just translated words because that seems to be the sense of it, but it's actually the word. 
We're going to find it here and also in verse 17. And I think it, in, the, in the Septuagint, uh, the word is in the singular, interestingly enough. And we'll, uh, we'll, well, we'll move on. Let's not make too much of that. When you get to verse 15, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. You, you may recall Abraham and Sarah by the oaks of Mamre in Genesis 18. Remember, they were visited by three visitors, which turn out to be two angels and the Lord himself. And do you remember how uh, Abraham immediately gets three measures of meal? And from that day on, in the Arab as well as the Hebrew culture, that's the fellowship offering, and uh, insisted they have give them a meal. As it turns out, two of them, two of the visitors, have a date the following chapter, in chapter 19, at a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. As they take off, the, the leader, obviously the Lord, lets Abraham in on what's coming. And we have this colorful passage in Genesis 18 where Abraham tries to negotiate. You're going to wipe out the whole city? What if there's 50 good people there? Well, if there's 50, I'll let it go. And you have to almost do this with a Jewish accent. Abraham says, what if there's 45? Well, there's 45. Would you want to find them? And then 40. Then 30. Takes him down to 10. But he realizes he's pushing his luck by then. But uh, there's a very profound issue there. Because you clearly get the impression that as long as there was one, the city would be spared. And there was one by the name of Lot. And in 19, when the two angels go to Sodom and Gomorrah and have this sordid affair with the homosexuals of the city that were trying to take them, they supernaturally blind them. And, but they point out to Lot and his family to get out of there. And they're not doing them a favor, per se. They can't do their job as long as Lot's there. If you read that text carefully, everybody misses that. You got to get out of here so that we can do it. And it's a prerequisite condition. And of course, you know the story. So anyway, uh, but again, this 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 urge to to uh, detain the angel of the Lord and, and provide uh, victuals. Huh? She says, "Let us detain thee until we have made ready a kid for thee." This is also similar. You may recall in, in Judges six when we were with Gideon, he did the same thing in terms of trying to provide the messenger something. And you get to verse sixteen. The angel of the Lord said unto Manoah. Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel lord. So he still just thinks this guy is some kind of super prophet or something. He doesn't have the whole picture here. Manoah said unto the angel lord, What is thy name? That when thy sayings come to pass, notice not if, when. When thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. The angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou this after my name? Seeing it is secret, is in the King James. Now, if we have King James only people here, my apologies. I prefer the King James in general. But here's one of those cases that it obscures a discovery. The word there is for wonderful. I'm putting it wonderful. Because I'll show you why in a minute. Pele, which is wonderful. It also means incomprehensible, extraordinary. Hard to understand. That's why the King James translators call it secret. But wonderful is an acceptable translation of that. And in fact, it, it will show up a verse or two later and will, it'll be translated wondrously. I might point out that the New King James, the American Standard Version, the, Se the English of the, the uh, translation of the Septuagint, the New American Standard, the Revised Standard Version, the English Standard Version, Young's Literal Translation, and the douay Rheims American Edition, the Catholic Bible, all render this term wonderful. Wonderful. Now, why do I prefer that? Besides the abundance of, of modern scholarship here, there's another reason. You all have seen it on Christmas cards. Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. By the way, hidden in the grammar of that phrase is a proclamation of his humanity as well as his divinity. The child is born in a manger in Bethlehem. But the son was preexistent from eternity past. 
and he was given. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Really? I wonder when that's going to be. Christians all over the world pray, Thy kingdom come, and have no idea what they're praying. Because their churches haven't taught them that he's coming back to set up a political rule on the planet Earth. Because he has to inherit the king, uh, the throne of David has not yet. But anyway, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called what? Wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Anyway, let's moving on. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering, offered it upon a rock unto the Lord, and the angel did what? Wondrously. There's that same word, by the way. And Manoah and his wife looked on. I hope they fasten their seatbelts. Notice what happens next. For it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. <laughs> and Manoah and his wife looked upon it and fell on their faces to the ground. Well, that was quite an exit, huh? But you see, that's, I think, anticipatory of the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. They fell on their face to the ground, but the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and his wife than Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord, a messenger of the Lord. Boy, no kidding, Dick Tracy. Can you imagine that? We read these things so casually. That must have blown them away. But it also struck terror in Manoah's heart because he was convinced he was destined to die because of that. And his wife gives him some good common sense. Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. And uh, he's, not be, you know, he's being scripturally on target here. Exodus 33.20 and Deuteronomy 8.16 and other passages. Uh, this is, he's, he's justifiably frightened fundamentally. You know, it, it, there, there's so much here we could really spend time on. Um, this mysterious name of Jesus Christ um, we'll discover all through the book of Revelation. Chapter 3, chapter 19, chapter 21. We have repeated allusions to a name which no one knows. A secret name of Jesus Christ. And uh, there are all kinds of scholastic conjectures as to what it is. That's wasting our time there. Uh, but the, it's clear, clearly this mystery of his name is, is uh, something I'll let you chase down. There will be notes in your in the company the tape that uh, will give you a toehold on that one. But it's worth it's a worthwhile study. But anyway, Manoah is panicked because he thinks he's going to die. But his wife said unto him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would, as at this time, have told us such things as these. That makes sense. The gal straightened him out. Boy, I wish I could list the times that my gal straightened me out on things like this. God uses, you know, we speak of a chain of command, but there's also a chain of counsel. It goes the other way. Very exciting. But anyway... So she uh, lays it down. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the name Samson comes from Shemesh, which means sunny or brightness. I wish he'd lived up to his name a little bit. Very, very strong, but whimsical. Anyway, the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. You know, uh, other judges in the book of Judges were clothed in the Spirit, but only Samson is the judge. It says that, that the Lord blessed him. And then we get to verse 25. The Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Estreol. So he's starting to wander. Estreol is about one and a half miles uh, east-northeast of Zorah. He would later, Samson would be later buried halfway between those two cities. Uh, that's his hometown. Now the secret of Samson's strength, of course, is just what you're reading here, the Spirit of the Lord. His Nazarite vow is emblematic of that. And it was symbolized by his unshorn hair. And that's going to be very important when you get in subsequent chapters. There's only a few of the feats of Samson recorded in the Bible. We know there's a number of others. I'll call these just a few pranks. We're going to find uh, in the next chapter, he's going to kill a lion barehanded. That's impressive. Think about it. And he will, as a result of a riddle situation, he will slay 30 Philistines in that chapter. 
In the following chapter, he's going to catch 300 foxes, tie their tails together and put a firebrand between them, turn them loose in the Philistines' crops. That got him mad, I think. And then several times when he's bound, he breaks the bonds as if they were threads. And then there's one place there where he slays a thousand Philistines. Laying nearby was the jawbone of a a skeleton of a donkey that had died long before. He took the jawbone as a weapon and slays 1,000 men with the jawbone of a donkey. And then he carries away the gate of Gaza. This is a huge bronze gate, gigantic. He carries it away 38 miles. And of course, his climactic event where he destroys, he brings the temple of the Philistines down on the Philistines. And in his death, he kills more Philistines than he did all the rest of them put together. But let's move on to the next chapter, Judges 14. Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, Timnath is maybe three to four miles away from his hometown, Zorah. Now, we're going to discover that Samson is a man of faith. He's also listed in Hebrews 11, verse 32. We talked about Jephthah as another example. Samson makes the hall of faith. He is a man of faith, and yet he is not a faithful man. He wasn't faithful to his parents' teaching. He wasn't faithful to his Nazarite vow or the laws of the Lord. So that's the great tragedy of Samson. Now, he wanders four miles in enemy territory, and he's captivated by this woman, in effect. This also is contrary to God's law in Exodus 34, Deuteronomy 7. And even 2 Corinthians 6, there are allusions to this. That's what he wants. He goes to, now marriages in those days were arranged by parents, so he went, he went his, his father's mother said to him, Is there never, has there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all thy people, excuse me, all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? Well, Samson's resolute. He says, Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. Now, the way that's translated, please me well, misses an opportunity. What it literally says, she is right in my eyes. You remember that there's that echo, there's a refrain all through the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's not a good thing. It's an indictment. We'll see it in chapter 17, 21. We always repeat it. It's, it's really the, the theme of the book of Judges. The tragedy of the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It leads to disaster over and over and over again. And how tragic it is, that's the cornerstone of our current philosophy in our own culture. Value relativism. You've got your truth, I've got mine. Everything's okay. Everyone's do, do is right in your own eyes. That's a denial of a sovereign God and His authority to make the rules. But now there's something... But they didn't recognize, they're doing the right thing in the sense, but they also didn't recognize that this was God's, uh, part of his program here. In verse 4, but his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord, that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. I might mention, by the way, many of the Israelites were happy under that. They had accommodated themselves to the Philistine dominion. They didn't want someone going around rocking the boat. But uh, the Lord had him there to rock the boat. We'll find out when you get to uh, chapter 15 and also 1 Samuel 7 that it isn't until prayers of Samuel and the conquest of David that they really get the Philistines under control. In any case, then Samson went down his father's mother to Timnath. Now, they both went to Timnath, but Samson apparently peels off on his own here because he has an episode that, where he's alone there. It's on this trip, but he's by himself. Or maybe they just took separate cars, I guess, or whatever. Anyway, um, then went Samson down his father and his mother Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him. Now the vineyards of Timnath are in the valley of Sorek, which means the choices of wines. It's famous for its wines. It's mentioned in Isaiah 5 and Jeremiah 2 and so forth. But the first question you've got to ask yourself, what's a Nazarite doing in a vineyard? You know, he, he wasn't supposed to be there in the first place. 
What was David doing on his balcony when he should have been with his troops in, in the field? If he'd been where he was supposed to, he wouldn't hand that situation with Bathsheba and the rest of it. Anyway, here's the Venezuela in the vineyard. I'll call this strike one. And here's a lion. Who else goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? Satan. You're going to have your encounters with lions also. And the Spirit of the Lord, which is your only defense against lions, by the way, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. It's a very exciting episode, but he kept to himself. And by the way, it says he would have rented not as, it's not a kid. In the Hebrew, there's a definite article, rent as the kid. And this is a f- expression, the picture is being painted here. It's as if you're at a banquet and you're ripping, you're, you're tearing off a leg from a cooked uh, uh, kid, a lamb. You follow me? It's the kind of thing that, that a chef or a host might do at a banquet. As you might rent the kid. It's an idiom, if you will, that derives from their, their fancier meals. He rent him as he would have rent the kid, like at a banquet, what have you. In any case, he does it with his bare hands, but he doesn't tell anybody. It becomes kind of important. Now, and by the way, Gustav Dore did a whole, about 240 illustrations, they're classic illustrations, back in about 1860s. This is just one. Many of you may see some of these in the, in the old Bibles. I can throw it up here because it's outside of copyright protection. So I thought I'd throw, this is just a classical rendering. We'll throw a few Dory pictures throughout our rendering here. Well, he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. So he's living by sight, not by faith. Remember the lust of the eyes in 1 John 2.16? Lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and so on. But he was pleasing himself, not the Lord. And as we watch this unfold, let's be very careful. Let's be very careful. How often do we prioritize our life by what pleases us rather than what we in our heart of hearts know pleases the Lord? If it pleases you to please the Lord, you can do as you please. (laughs) We have liberty in Christ, but that liberty is to be used, is to be directed to pleasing the Lord. But this is not the case here. So, and after a time, he returned to take her. Now, this is, in other words, a subsequent visit. Some time has gone by, because I assume this carcass is now, has rotted. Because after a time, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. I'll call this strike two. He's not supposed, he's a Nazarite. He's not supposed to touch a dead thing. Turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and he gave them and they did eat. He told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of a lion. That would have been unclean for them too. Now he's going to make this the key, a part of a riddle and 30 people are going to die over all of this. So there's going to be a drinking party and there's going to be a riddle at the drinking party. So his father went down unto the woman and Samson made there a feast. So used the young men to do or they used to do that, uh, a drinking party. But it's going to go on seven days, by the way. This is a part where they, they, they knew how to party. They, and it came to pass when they saw him, the Philistines saw him, that they brought him 30 companions to be with him. That's a strange phrase. It gives rise to a lot of conjectures. He didn't have his own friends of the bridegroom around. It's, it's a big wedding thing going on. The Philistines provide him 30 companions. Now, this is just conjecture. But I suspect that they were also there to keep him under control. Samson makes them nervous. And right, they should be nervous. But they got 30 companions. These 30 companions are there perhaps with their own agenda. Well, perhaps to ease the tensions, whatever, Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you. If you can certainly declare it me within the seven days of the feast... That's quite a feast. It's a whole week of just drinking and partying. But if you can certainly declare it to me within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 changes of garment. The word sheets and change of garments, I should explain a little bit. The sheets were actually like an undergarment. 
and the change of garments was the exterior. They typically, if you're wealthy, had uh, had uh, you know double double layer. The first layer was like what functionally very similar to what we think of as underwear, and then the external garment, which is typically embroidered, and the hem would carry uh, indicate in the Jewish culture would indicate the, the rank, the role, what have you. Uh, so anyway, if you will, I will give you each one of you know the thirty. The thirty are treated as a group. I'll give you. I'll give you thirty sheets and thirty change of garments. But if you cannot declare it unto me, then shall ye give me thirty sheets and thirty change of garments. That's his proposition. They, not to be outdone, they take it. Take him up on it. They said unto him, Put forth thy riddle, that we may hear it. And he said to them, as it rendered the King James, Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not in three days expound the riddle. So they're trying for three days and can't get the... It, they've got them. Another way of rendering this, because, see, the word meat in our language, we, we think of meat as you know, results of animal you know, food. Uh, the word meat that actually means something to eat. A, a, a better way to render this would be, Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. But they can't come up with anything. It came to pass on the seventh day that they said to Samson's wife, Entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Boy, these guys don't mess around. This kid, this gal, is really got a serious threat on her hands because these guys do that sort of thing. Lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Have he called us to take that we have? Is it not so? These guys really feel they've been sand-trapped here. They're upset. Now, what's confusing about these verses a little bit, you get the impression that she's trying to find out the riddle just from this point on. No, she's been trying to find out for seven days because she's a woman. <laughs> you know? And so she's been badgering him. Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and hast not told it me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father and my mother. Shall I tell it thee? And she wept before him the seven days. That's what's confusing because a lot of this comes to a climax, but it's sort of going back now to pick up the whole thing. She's been badgering him all the time anyway. Now when these 30 guys come and threaten her, with her life and her father's life and so forth, she's starting to get really... It tends to create a sense of urgency here. <laughs> so she wept before him the seven days while the feast lasted, and it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her because she lay sore upon him. So he finally yields on that last day, and of course she told the riddle to the children of her people. Why? To save her father's house and herself, and you can't blame her in that sense. You've got to blame him, though. That wasn't too smart. You know what a secret is. You have to understand what a secret is. A secret is something you tell one person at a time. <laughs> the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? Whoops. And he said to them, If ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye would not have found out my riddle. He's really teed off. Not just because he lost, but they cheated. From his point of view, in fact, some comments feel he would probably be justified in reneging on the basis they broke the rules, in a sense. But Samson's got a different program. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon. That's a long way to the coast. That's more than 20 miles by foot. There's no Hertz cars around this area. Uh, it's, it's a way over there. Went down to Ashkelon and, and slew 30 men. That's sort of a casual summary of some real adventure here. One guy slew 30 men of them, took their spoil. So he did this in Ashkelon, which is far enough away that there'd at least be some delay before the crowd in Timnath would have caught on to what's going on here. 30 guys mugged in an alley. 30 changes of garment, both the, in, in, uh, both the uh, sheets and the exchange of garments, unto them which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled. <laughs> Samson's upset. And it's dangerous to have Samson upset. 
Again, he's a champion, but not a leader. So these are just pranks of various kinds. They get pretty serious. His anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. He didn't consummate his marriage. From his point of view, he thought he was still married, but he so teed off, he just went home. And it was common in those marriages that even in marriage, sometimes the bride would stay with the parents for a while. So I won't get into all that here, but anyway. So he went up to his father's house. But meanwhile, while he's gone, Samson's wife is given by her father to his best, to his companion. Presumably, Samson's best man. It's rendered here, whom he had used as his friend. Out of this gang there, of the 30, there's one apparently that he felt close to. He trusted. That was the one that the father of the gal gives. He was probably the guy to whom she told the riddle. That's an inference, a conjecture, but it would fit. But in any case, the father of the bride, even though she, he, he presumably had received the dowry for her already, he just gives her to this guy as a wife. And that's going to upset Samson in the coming chapter. Women can be the measure of weakness in a man. And that's certainly true here. She enticed him, then controlled him, and of course finally betrayed him. Ashkelon, by the way, is named after the Ashkelon, or the Shalot. But these 30 guys died because of a party wager. And uh, the presumption is that he went home angry. He probably planned to return at the wheat harvest, which he's going to do in chapter 15, verse 1 and following. But when he gets back in chapter 15, he's going to discover that she's not his wife. Then he gets really mad. So this turn of events that's going to start unfolding here is going to motivate Samson to fight the Philistines as a group instead of just entertaining them. The tragedy is that Samson is being manipulated, in a sense, here to achieve God's purposes rather than really be led by the Spirit. He's just angry for his own reasons, but God will use that. Psalm 32, verse 8 and 9 says, I will guide thee, actually, I will instruct thee and teach thee the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as a horse or as a mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in by bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee, and so forth. We're going to discover Samson's lack of leadership, his attempt to go it alone, is going to just lead to disaster. And yet God will even use that. Samson really will accomplish little more than harassing the Philistines right up to the, uh, to the end. We're going to discover that Samson's era is about 20 years. It's probably the last 20 of the 40 that the Philistines are having dominion. Samson ends where 1 Samuel picks up, in a sense. We're facing a lot of action forthcoming. Uh, and uh, so we'll, we, I didn't try to get through all four chapters in one evening. We'll take the last two chapters, uh, chapters 15 and 16, uh, next time. Samson, very colorful, very well known. But when you look at it right in the eye, it's a very discouraging portrayal. Here's a guy that had so much promise and yet blew it, trying to do it alone. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. A couple of things to think about. Bring up during your discussion group if you like. How do the enigmas that surround Samson illuminate the enigmas in your own life? Are there places, are there ways in which God has called each of us that we acknowledge and yet Do we really prioritize? Do we really focus? Do we really enlist our resources in the acquittal of those callings? It's easy to criticize Samson. He's he's colorful, but criticizable. And yet there, there are many lessons, many, many lessons there. Let's buy our hearts.